real good to be here today. Um, some of you probably noticed I got, I got a black eye. I did that two weeks ago, we're doing something stupid. Have you ever done anything like that? Over the course of my career, I've had a lot of student interns, and, and uh, I've always had some gate lever gates. Some of them open to the side, and some of those man killers that come over the top. And I said, look, if there's ever a loop or a snap on there, and you're going to undo that with one hand, have the other hand on the gate lever. I broke my rule. I removed the loop, the gate lever popped me right inside of the head. It began to swell pretty good right there, and so I started icing it up. It must have driven the blood right to my eye. But anyway, some interesting things happened. Um, I walked into a, a house of a consulting client, and his wife was seated at his computer, and she looked at me, and she knows me fairly well. She said, you look horrible. She said, oh, excuse me, I didn't mean that to come out the way it sounded. Uh, and I, I said, um, yeah, but you should see the other guy. <laughs> and uh, some people come right with that. They see me and they say, what's the other guy look like? And so you got to go to the hospital to see him. <laughs> so you, you know, you can kind of come up with quite a few of these little things. But at any rate, um, let's visit a little bit. I, I really appreciate Bill's talk. And for those of you who in here in this room who are here wondering if this stuff works, let me assure you it does. I was probably as fixed in my ways, set in my ways, a victim of what I had called in some of my articles paradigm lockdown, as anybody could be, until I was somewhere in graduate school. And uh, in the process of getting data together for a master's degree thesis, my major professor and I visited 92 ranches in the state of Wyoming, which is my native state. And uh, I took the eastern half of Wyoming. My professor took the western half. That's because I was raised in the western half, and I wanted to get a little more familiar with the eastern half. And uh, as I was collecting data for my thesis, there was a number of questions that I would ask people that I visited, and I got to one man, and one of the questions was, well, what are the winning weights of your calves? Um, he told me a number that was about 100 pounds heavier than anything I had heard or seen. And uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, I, I grew up with Herford cattle. We had both registered and commercial at that day. And, now, this is a long time ago, you got to remember. But at any rate, uh, so I thought that's the way you ran cattle. And because we were selling bulls, naturally you didn't try to AI or anything like that. I asked Mr. Cumberbill, okay, how did you get weights like this? And he said, well, I do two things. I don't know which works the best, but he said, I'm convinced they both work. He said, I use artificial insemination and I crossbreed. Boy, that was just like two fast slaps across the face of this kid. Now, I'm still a proponent of crossbreeding. I don't know about the AI. I'm kind of in the field scamp of that. I'm kind of a recovering AI uh, addict. You know, I never was an addict. I didn't get that far into it, even though I worked for an AI firm for several years to learn animal science after having two degrees in ag economics, some of which was not very useful. Um, but at any rate, um, The point that I want to make, I wanted to go see his cows, and I went and saw those cows, real beautiful set of red cows. Okay, what are you breeding these cows to? Well, he said, I just breed them to whatever they have the least of, and I'm using the Herbert Angus and Shorthorn. That's all that was available in those days. They didn't have limousine, Simmental, Gelby, et cetera. I mean, we were just starting to hear about them. And, uh, but a very nice set of cows, and I, I had another appointment or two that day, and it was, this was a Friday, and I was, I was going back to, to Laramie to spend the weekend with my wife and a couple of young sons. And, uh, and as I drove, I had a real conversation with myself. And, I, and the gist of that conversation was, okay, Tiger, you've got to learn to be open-minded. 
but at the same time, you've got to do it without being gullible. And uh, because I started to make that shift in my mindset and recognized further back in my past some missed opportunities because I wasn't going to go listen to somebody because they were talking about something that I thought was stupid or wouldn't work. And, uh, and it just happens that I was invited to speak at the International Stopping School, something that went on years ago. And I came out of, I came out of my lecture, the first lecture, I gave two or three there, and there were a lot of us, presenters there, lecturing in separate places. And uh, I came out of mine and I walked by the door in kind of an outdoor corridor, and people coming out of this one classroom were just a buzz. And, uh, and one of them came up to me and said, did you hear that? And I said, no, I was lecturing in another, in another room. He said, well, this guy's gonna talk again. When he talks, you wanna, you wanna listen. And I said, well, who is that guy? And he said, well, his name's Alan Sabre. He's from South Africa or Rhodesia or someplace like that. Zimbabwe, they call it now. But at any rate, he, uh, he said, you, you better go look, listen to him. You know, you know, I read his deal in the, his byline in there and put ecologist on there. Well, I wasn't going to listen to the dang ecologist. And, uh, but at any rate, because this guy told me about the excitement of his talk, I decided I'd go listen to the next talk. And so when he begins to talk, what's he talking about? He's talking about four ecologically called building blocks then, ecological uh, processes which really come together as one process, when we understand it truly. But he started talking about these, and I knew several rain scientists in this room, and when he's talking about this, this was a review of the previous day, and he went through it kind of quickly, but the, the rain scientists were all doing this. Then he, Got done with that and said, okay, that's reviewed yesterday, the principles of this thing. Now I want to propose a grazing method that will take into account those principles and help you grow a lot more grass, improve stocking rates, improve soil health, etc., etc. And when he began to diagram on the board, or with a set of slides, I don't remember what he had in his presentation. We didn't have PowerPoint yet then. Um, but at any rate, he began to show, and these same heads start doing this. And I couldn't figure that out because it all linked up for me for some strange reason. Maybe I was, you know, inexperienced enough that I, I could, I could buy it. Well, it was just one more example. Of me. I'm not sure why those heads ever did this. It was pretty logical. I then met in that same. Stockman School, a man who beat him back to South Africa because he wanted to go see if what he was talking about really does happen. And he saw, and he, and he hired his consulting services, and, and then I was invited at my friend's place when he was consulting there and I had a very early acquaintance. And it began to change my life. And I guess I'd want to say, probably didn't buy everything there for line and sinker. It took some time to understand what was true principle and what were maybe some attitudes about the principles. And then I began to meet some other people with good ideas and progressive. And it was a it was really a life changer for me. I don't know which way I got a point this to make our slides change. There we go. At any rate I need to jump from there into my subject, but I just wanted to try to encourage those of you who may be leaning a little, sitting on the fence, wondering about ecological principles and if you can graze better, if you can farm better, let me assure you, you can. I've got enough gray hair and little enough of it uh, that I've, I've seen a lot of, a lot of examples. There's four areas we have to manage. And if we don't manage all of them, there's a chance we, we won't make it. We're going to love some of this management, and we're going to 
put up with some of the rest of it. We still have to do it. We have to manage production. Most of us love that. We have to manage economics and finance. Most of us don't like that. I managed ag economics because of my grandfather who went through the third grade and then dropped out because his father had died. His mother only spoke German very well and, uh, and he, uh, he had to go to work to sustain himself. His mother couldn't get very good jobs. And uh, he, he told me that I needed to get a lot more education if I wanted to be involved in ranching than he had. And he said, I have watched you and you love the livestock and you love the grasslands. You better major in business because that's, that's a pretty important part of what we do. For me, very good advice. Um, marketing. Two minutes ignore marketing. Especially with cattle and the odds and ends, the culls. And we leave 50 to to $100 and maybe more on the table most of the time when we work with that. And then we must manage people. Sometimes when I point out that you should manage people, some people say, well, gosh, it's just me and the wife and the three kids. Why do we need to manage people? When I hear that, I think, mm -hmm, you probably got a little problem here. Uh, that's maybe when it's the most needed. Because to manage business and interact as family and trying to marry those two processes is not always easy or smooth. And uh, we love each other, but we, we're almost too frank with each other. We're not, uh, we're not totally equipped to really deal on a business level. The other thing beyond that, if it's just me and the wife and the three kids, we buy our supplies from somebody, don't we? We sell our product to somebody, don't we? We can have them be effective members of our team if we select properly. And, uh, and can expect them to be members of our team and we can manage those relationships appropriately. I recall when I first went to Nebraska, had an office just out of a little town called Whitman, not too far from Hyannis. And you know, it's kind of an out of the way place. I had more people come by my office, more feed salesmen come by my office than I thought existed on the face of the whole earth. And I wonder if they thought I was stupid or had deep pockets. But I hope neither one was true. But at any rate, it was amazing the culling process that I had to go through. Too many of those people selling feed knew so little about animal nutrition that I, I didn't I didn't want to buy their product, even if the product was magic. It could do wondrous things. So I kind of narrowed this pool down to five, and then I asked them to come and make a presentation to me on what their services, their products could do to match our objectives. In the meantime, I had given them clearly what our objectives were. And I said, frankly, I want to spend less and less money with you. But we are large enough that you would probably rather have what business we're going to give somebody than to not have it. And so the way you're going to get it is you're going to, you're going to help us become as efficient and effective with your products as we possibly can. And that means spend as little on them as we can and still get the return we want. So was that people management? That was people management. And it paid huge, huge dividends. I won't take time to tell the rest of that story, but it paid big, big, big dividends. Um, three ways to improve profit. Um, increase turnover. Some people equate that to getting a bigger ranch or a bigger farm. I basically say, hey, let's have the same size ranch and see if we can have more units to sell more units to sell. If we can do that without increasing overheads, we're going to make more money. And then if we can decrease overheads, that's another way to improve profit. And oh, there's way too many of us have way too many overheads. Overheads end up being people, facilities, land, equipment. It's, it's labor and what it takes us to get our job done. Um, then improve gross margin. Gross margin is, is the total returns minus the direct costs. And in the cattle business, the direct costs are mostly 
that and feed. But you'll have a little bit of trucking and brand inspection if you're in the brand inspection area. Um, sales commissions, a few things like that are direct. Time directly, they vary every time you change the number of cattle. But three ways to improve profit. We'll refer back to these occasionally. This is just a diagram, a, a diagram that schematically shows how making those changes does in fact change your profit. Uh, profit being that area right there between those two curves, loss being that difference right in there. Um, okay, so if we can reduce overheads, let's review quickly. This morning we talked about four things we need to manage. Production, economics and finance, marketing, people. We're usually not good at all of those. Um, it's nice to have a member of our team, even if it's our spouse or one of the children, that can help with that. If not, maybe find a neighbor if we're a small family operation. If we're larger and have people on our staff that have those abilities, let's use those abilities. Um, we need to get good at all four. Three ways to make a profit. Increase turnover, reduce overheads, increase gross margin. Our gross margin is defined as total returns minus direct costs, or direct costs are just those costs, and only those costs that vary every time we change the number of livestock we have. And then we began on five essentials. The first essential being our approach to management should be both integrated and holistic. You can call it holistic systems approach if you would like. Um, we need to have that kind of an approach. And then essential number two was we want to strive for continuous improvement of the key resources, land, livestock, and people. And we allow that sometimes wildlife will figure into that component of key resources. So we'll pick up from there. We then, we looked at some ideas for improvement of the land, being plant time controlled grazing, and uh, Phil did a wonderful job this morning showing you how some of that works. You know, I have to plead guilty, I didn't take near enough pictures. Over the last 30 years, I should have been packing the camera with me most every day, because almost every day I saw something that I sure could have used later and I didn't. So I would encourage you younger folks that are just starting out on some progressive, progressive farming and or grazing techniques. In fact, well now you can get your cell phone, take pictures and uh, take them at the same point. That's the nice thing to build it. I don't feel, do you use GPS coordinates or how do you, is he here? Anyway, he, he, he framed those pictures the same every single time and that's not always easy to do, but that sure makes a nice year over here comparison with you when you do that. Um, let's talk about continuous improvement of the livestock, and I think it begins with cattle selected for this. What is this? Cattle that, when the feed quality goes bad, and maybe even the palatability goes bad, can survive on that kind of stuff. Um, this is that same ranch in Utah, about 6,200 feet elevation, 6,300 feet elevation. Um, a lot of feed like this in the wintertime. A lot of irrigated meadow, and to get rapid stalker gain. In the summertime, you leave a lot of feed, which ends up becoming winter cow feed. And, uh, and the area right here is an area that's so wet that you couldn't even graze it very well in the summertime, definitely couldn't hay it, kind of rank stuff, but cows end up doing pretty well, maintain pretty good body condition, but the cows have to be selected for that. Uh, it takes a while to get them adapted, but it's, it's doable, you can adapt them, they, they'll, they'll do nicely. How do you get there? I think you select the right bull, and I want one moderate size or small. Um, probably discern that I am not a fan of large cattle. I, I just think it's, we've made a lot of mistakes with those. Um, I have, I don't know, I, it seems like after I talk to an audience like this, 
I'll have a number of people every time come to me afterward and say, you know, we used to get pregnancy rates in the low 90s. We struggled out to keep them even in the low 80s. They tend to want to drop into the 70s. And I ask them about cow size, milking ability, and heterosis, and they're almost straight one breed now, and they have uh, huge cows, and they have high milking ability. They've selected for high milk EPDs now for a long time, and they, they're not getting those cows pregnant. Now, that all one breed, I'm not criticizing the one breed or any breed. I just think that we got to keep them smaller, we got to have them give a little less milk, and, uh, and have them crossbred. Can you tell us what you mean by moderate? Uh, small would maybe be a cow that would uh, 1050 to 1100, moderate might be 1250 tops. Uh, and that's that's in working condition. Give another 100 pounds if they're dry in the, in the summertime, fail to have a calf and you take a fat cow to market, you know, as a dry. Kind of be, you know, that's my more or less. Yes? Sir, for up here in this country, in North Dakota here, what what breed or mix of breed would you recommend for up in this kind of an environment? The question was what breed or mix of breed would I recommend for this kind of an environment? Um, I'm not sure I would. Um, <laughs> uh, that ain't no cows at all. <laughs> with, no, I've had cows. I, you know, I, I ranched for a long time in in uh, in Nebraska, in the, in the Sand Hills of Nebraska, west western part of the Sand Hills. We made our own composite there, and we were roughly 50% Angus in that composite. The way we, the way we made it, the way we kept putting it together, those numbers are very little. About a quarter Simmental, and about a, the other quarter was a mishmash. We, we could never find just the bull we seemed to want that was not too big, didn't have too much milk, um, and that sort of thing. And so we used a variety of breeds as long as we thought they would match with the. Angus and Simmental we were using from a size standpoint and uh, you know we we like to have not very much white on the cattle because of eye problems other problems you know and that kind of stuff uh, minimize the white we didn't mind seeing the white face you know, occasionally so we used to pull for it occasionally I have to think that this is an economically important trait <coughs> and I grew up with order for cattle but I still say that but I think it's a but you know, there's there's a lot to like about a lot of the breeds, and there's something to dislike about every one of them too. So, you know, just and I try to cross them in such a way that the strengths of one tend to offset the weaknesses of another. Um, you know, right now black is beautiful, and and that probably says something to us of what we should use. But hopefully, black will always be beautiful. I mean, it can be beautiful, but something else be beautiful too. Um, I, I think we miss a lot of good cattle by trying to make them all black. So anyway, just, just a quick off the cuff. Milk most people have and want too much. We discussed that earlier today. I don't think we need to do that. Care requirement. Do you have to feed them to keep them in condition? If so, do you want their heifer calves? Remember we're selecting the right bull. And if there's anything that gets in my craw, is to grab an article from the popular press from now or breeding season, telling me how I should be wintering my bulls so that they'll get cows pregnant next summer. Hey, that bull doesn't have to lactate or gestate. I should be able to put him in a far corner pasture and give him enough protein to eat the feed that's out there, and he should be able to maintain himself, or do I want his daughters? What kind of cows are they going to be? You know, we got to be careful how we select these bulls. If we want cows, we'll do what I showed you on the previous picture. We just got to be careful because uh, a pampered bull from pampered cows won't produce those kind of dollars. The color right cow, and those are the ones I like to call. I want to give it all the opens, all the dries. I don't know. It seems like this terminology is someplace always understood. When I talk about open, I mean not pregnant at preg check time. When I talk about dry, I'm talking about calving season's over and she doesn't have a calf inside. She's a dry cow now. She's not yet pregnant. She's a dry cow. I want those cows gone. I want them to weed a calf every year and get pregnant. But again, now they naturally don't all do that even though I want them to, but I'm going to get rid of the ones that don't. Requires individual attention or help. In other words, if I have to, if I have to touch an animal as an individual, apart from the herd, 
Now, if I'm given, if I'm given a, a shot to hold her a Craig check time, that, that doesn't count. But if I have to catch one to talk to her, handle her in any way, help her tear, I want to get rid of those cows. She's wild, raises a poor cat. Some of you probably read some of my articles. If you do, you know I, I don't believe much in, in records on cattle in a commercial setting. And that's why. If the cow's open, I don't need a paper record. Even a computerized record to tell me she's open. I sort them off the end of the Craig shoot. I might put a tag in her ear then that tells me something. I might put a mark on her with a, with a, what am I trying, with a bleach that will last for a while that tells me that she is open. Something so I can recognize her a month later if I don't find that the market's right to sell her for a while. Same with a dry. If I can't tell the dry cow at the end of the calving season, I probably ought not be in the cow business. And uh, I can sort off those dry cows fairly easy. Uh, certainly when I have to give them attention, I've got them caught. That's the best time in the world to get a mark on them. And just let you know that she's a cow cow now. Wild, I might have to sort those, do a little more, but I don't need records to tell me she's wild. Um, poor calf, some people rely on the records to tell them the calf is poor. I don't think you need to do that. <coughs> You know, I can put calves down an alley, and I can sort the little ones off. And yeah, I'm going to put a few of the bigger little ones in the, in the big group, and I'm going to put a few of the little big ones in the little group. Make a few mistakes there. I'm going to get rid of the bad ones. And, and then I'll, I can do that the day I wean the calves, hold those calves overnight, put them back with the mothers the next morning. When they mother up, it's easy enough to ride them off. And, and uh, you know, and I got those cows marked, and I didn't have to have a paper record or computer record number one to call these cows. Hope that makes a little bit of sense for just some simplicity. I just believe in simplicity in operations in commercial. Now, if you're a seed stock breeder and you're going to make seed stock for me, I want you to have every record on the face of the earth. I want you to be able to tell me everything about that. Well, you can. I want, I want you to be able to tell me if you ever had to help his mother have a calf. I want you to be able to tell me how, how good those calves grew. I want you to tell me that what her hip height of the daughters of that bull or the sisters of that bull or the mother of that bull, whatever you have. I want to know things about that bull that maybe a lot of people don't want to know, but I want to know. Um, how do I get to efficient? I spelled two correctly, by the way. How do I get there? How do I get to efficient? You buy small replacement cows that fit in my environment, or you raise replacement efficient bulls and cows that fit my environment. And I, I'm a real believer in this environmental fit thing. I just think they have to fit your environment. If you want to manage inexpensively, they've got to fit your environment. You cut inputs and then you cull the right cow. Uh, as you reduce inputs, you're going to have a few cattle fall out that weren't falling out before. But the ones that stay, stay because they fit. Now this last statement I think is important. <coughs> Longevity is a result of fertility. You know, people talk about long-lived cows and longevity. Well, most any cow until she's 20 years old can really keep her that long. She might not have very many calves. You know, there might be a lot of other things she might do. She might be in the neighborhood because she tore through the fence a lot of times. She might, uh, you know, her calf might always be small, but they'll, they'll last. But most of them, most cows' longevity ends because she fails to get pregnant and we sell her. Now, all kinds of you get old and you call them because of bad udders or this, that, or the other. But most of them leave her because of fertility. And I think fertility is a result of environmental fit. If the critter fits the environment, she will get pregnant. If she doesn't fit the environment, she struggles to get pregnant or you have to feed her a bunch to get her prepared. Okay, that's my take on cows. High EPDs for growth, I don't care much of those. High EPDs for milk, I dislike those. I want a moderate milk EPD when I'm looking for bulls. I want, mo I want good but moderate growth EPDs. I don't want the cattle to get too big, but I do want cattle to fit the environment. Continuous improvement of people. Uh, that begins with understanding the manager's job. 
I've thought a lot about this. And I think the manager's job is to create an environment in which people want to excel. And then provide the tools and the training and the freedom to do it. Now, if I separate myself from others as managers at all, it's probably because of this philosophy. <coughs> people used to come to our ranch in Nebraska. And uh, we were a large ranch. And for a number of years, then we expanded again, but for a number of years before we expanded the last time, we were running about 7,000 cows and about five to 6,000 yearlings, depending on the year. And every full-time man, we didn't have very many, had a large herd, seven to 900 cows in his herd. And uh, during the winter months, he would submit how much feed he had fed to our office, and then the office would put out a comparative report herd by herd, how much cake, how much hay, how much salt and mineral, how much for, for the whole herd, how much per head, and what did it cost per head, per day, per head, per month, year to date total. And so they had these numbers, and people would come to visit the ranch from universities or groups like some of yourselves, would come and visit and, and the guys would pull this piece of paper out of their hip pocket and, and answer questions to the guy. Well, how much cake have you fed this one? How much hay have you fed this one? What does that cost? And they could answer those questions. And they, they'd ask me, where do you get people like that? And I, you know, I, I don't think we, me included, were extraordinary. Just pretty common people. Now I, you know, I did have good employees. But I think there was another reason that they were good, and I think it's that we had this kind of philosophy. We got people, and he, he might have been very good where he had been before he came to us. But we took time to train them. We, I, I think it's grossly unfair for us to hire somebody that's been good someplace else and assume that he will know how to ranch the way we want to ranch. And then just expect him to do it. I think that most of you that come to this kind of meeting are a little more progressive than that. And the way you want to ranch is not the typical, traditional cowboy way. And so if you expect your new employee to ranch that way, you've got to take time to train them. You have to take time to train your kids if you want them to do the job right. And, uh, and so training is extremely important. Also, if you're hiring people, there's a number of studies now that show that your orientation and training of these people is the most critical thing as to whether they stay with you or leave. And most of them make that decision in the first two weeks. If you properly orient and properly train and get them off to a good start, they decide to stay. If you haven't, they decide to leave. The problem of it is when they decide to leave, they don't tell you. They stay on the payroll. And they aren't going to leave until they find another job. But their heart and mind isn't with you, it's with finding the new job. So it becomes a real important, a real important issue. So this idea of people management takes on a lot of aspects that we need to be critical of. Everything we do starts and ends with people. You know, people have to implement ideas, they have to have the ideas in the first place, they have to modify ideas. And then they are rewarded by the completion, the successful completion of a good idea. Empowerment, can I empower anyone? The answer to that question is no. I told you about how people used to come to our ranch and ask about this and then they wanted me to come and talk about empowerment. How do you empower these people? My answer was, well, I don't. They empower themselves. But what can I do? I can encourage. I can facilitate, and I can reward empowerment. How do I encourage it? We had a we had kind of a standing rule. Every employee, full-time employee, left the ranch for one significant off-ranch learning experience every year. It might be as much as a three-day short course someplace. Um, we send them to grazing schools. We send them to this, that, and the other. Anything close by, We'd encourage them to go anytime they could get away. Um, 
a one-day deal that was close by. We encouraged them to visit neighbors' ranches that were doing progressive things. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's part of the encouragement. Facilitating, making the time available, making budget available so that they can do it. Reward it. When they get better, they learn, give more responsibility, give them, give them a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit bigger piece of the action, so to speak. And leadership. I've had a couple of stints, brief, both of them, at universities. And I've been a guest lecturer a number of times at universities, but once teaching a course on management, there was a chapter on leadership, and all the way through, the uh, the author was trying to define leadership, and he kind of fumbles around at it. He gets to the end of the chapter and says, well, I have a very well-defined leadership. I'm using my words to say what he said, but that's what he said. He kind of, kind of defined it very well. But I can tell you one thing. Though it's difficult to define, it is best gauged by the voluntary response of those being led. You know that I circled the word voluntary. Because if it's not voluntary, it's not leadership. And I think we need to remember that. You know, most of us have grown up, and I did. My father and my grandfather were very authoritarian in their managerial style. I can't blame either one of them for that. They were pretty good at it. That's what they had grown up under. That's what they would seen modeled. And, and like I said, they were reasonably good at it. I was about to take on that same style of management. And then <clears throat> I worked in the AI industry in California named Harold Schmidt, veterinarian. He and I became very good friends, but he had hired a group of us and basically gave us some objectives and a budget and got out of the way. One day I asked him how he dared do that. And he, he, he said, well, let me ask you a few questions. He said, when you, uh, when you interviewed with me, he said, you didn't like to interview me. I said, no. So then you can do the things you represented yourself as being able to do. I think so. He pushed that line of reason until I got just a little uncomfortable. But anyway, he, he intentionally wanted to make me a little uncomfortable, I'm sure. And then he said, well, what about the other guys here? Can they do, do you think they can do what they represent they can do? I said, well, it sure looks to me like they're doing it, they're doing it well. And I'm, I'm going to make a fairly long experience, quite short here, but he, he said, well, here's the reason. He said, I hired every one of you because I needed someone in that position to do that job better than I could do it myself. And that turned on a light for me. I became a general manager not very long after that. Well, way too young in age, way too inexperienced, lucked into the job. Why they hired me, I'll never know. But because of my exposure to Dr. Harold Schmidt and a delegative style of management, I was able to recognize talent in people that were beyond my own talents, place them properly, and we were successful. And that, that has made a huge, huge change in the way I approach management, and I have just looked for the talents in people. You know, too often we look for their weaknesses. We tend to judge from my strength to your weakness. Hey, that's easy judgment. My strength to your weakness. What I need to do is look for my weakness to your strength. And when I can do that, then I can build teams that can be successful. And that's what you want to do. And, you know, none of us have a corner on all the strengths. None of us have a corner on all the ideas. And if I can give all of my people an opportunity to succeed in and of themselves, they're going to like that. They readily know the difference. Am I just a robotic extension of the boss? Or am I a valued member of the team and my boss recognizes that I have a brain and I can think and I can reason and I am entitled to have a new idea that could be beneficial for the operation. And uh, in people management, in people improvement, I think those are the kind of approaches we need to take. And like I say, in agriculture, we've had this authoritarian style modeled to us so many times over and over. We're showing up at the barn at 7 o'clock in the morning, we'll give you your work for the day. And they don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, they just know what the day's going to bring. We've got to get beyond that where, where responsibilities are 
long lasting, and the responsibilities are ongoing. And, uh, and I think you can give them to your children at a pretty young age, in fact. This is yours. I'll help you, but you've got to ask for the help. I'll help you get better at it, but you've got to ask for the help. You've got to be willing to go to work, to work at it, but, but you can be successful at this. By the way, if it's not leadership, it's pushership. I don't know if you can use that word or not. Okay, three. Essential number three, the use of good planning tools and decision-making tools. And these are really important, and we've had some wonderful breakthroughs. But there's some things you must have to have good planning tools. You've got to have good financial records. And there's about three things that I want always in financial records. One, I want enter enterprise accounting. In other words, if I've got a CalCAF enterprise, I've got a yearling enterprise, a stalker enterprise, and maybe a heifer development enterprise, I want to look at those separately see which is doing the best. If I have to have some sheep, I want that separate. But I want just the direct costs. And I want by cost category. Okay? Was it feed? Was it trucking? Was it vet cost? Was it vet medicines? So I want to, I want to weigh it out by category. Quite a number of you are doing that, I, I would guess. And then I want a good separation of direct and overhead costs because I'm not going to allocate those overhead costs. Hey, they're, they're not going to change if I change my operation. They're, they're pretty much there. The only way I change overhead costs is decide that I won't need all that stuff and get rid of some of them. Um, and so, a good separation of direct and overhead costs. I want my overhead costs, I mean, I want my direct costs up toward the top of the cost side of my financial statement. I want the overhead costs more toward the bottom. And that's not so I can ignore them either. That's just because I want the presentation to be. And then I want a good record of all sales listed separately. If I haul 10 cows to the auction tomorrow and they sell, I want to have that record sale. 10 cows sold at such and such a livestock auction on such and such a date. Here's what the cows weighed, here's what they brought. And I'll put that in my computer in my Excel spreadsheet and it will calculate the price per head and the price per pound. And the average weight. I'll have the total weight and the total dollars and the number of head and it calculates everything else for me. But I'll list every single sale and when I start budgeting for future years, I can look at what every class of cow did. I'll put my cows in one place, but individual sale at a time. How many cows were in that sale? I'll put two-year-old heifers, I'll put steer calves, heifer calves, so on. And that, those numbers will help me estimate weights and prices as we move on down the road. And if I sold a cull cow for this price, how much did I sell a year before at the same time? Or roughly the same time? What did I sell a cow for at roughly the same time? So my budgeting as I move forward can have really good integrity when I do that. And you know, the biggest mistakes people make in budgets is not putting the price too high or too low. It's having a relationship between the two prices, or three prices or four prices, not relevant to each other. So they want to compare a cow-calf operation with a cow-yearling operation, but yet they don't price the yearlings and the calves fairly in relationship to each other. They can make really huge mistakes. So it's the internal pricing consistency. How does one price relate to another? It's far more important that if all the prices are a little too high or all the prices are a little too low in a budget scenario. Okay, then I want good production records. And I want these four especially, and you can think of others that you might want. And naturally, if you're a farmer, you want some yields. But I want weed cap crop percentages. I think that is the, that is the most important of all. The weed cap crop percentages of the cows that I had in my inventory going into calving season that I expected to calve because they were all pregnant according to the preg check, they were all pregnant, what, what percent of those weaned to calf? And I want pregnancy rates. Okay, how many did I put the pen in preg check? What percent of those were pregnant? Now some of you have heard the term calves weaned for cow exposed. I don't like that very well. And I'll give you the reason why. That's because it crosses across two years. I want people to be thinking of this year. How do I get cows pregnant this year for next year? And how do I keep calves alive? And we need a lot of them this year. If I want that number so I can benchmark against other people who have that number, calves we for cow exposed. If I multiply this year's weaned calf crop percentage by last year's pregnancy rate, I have a very, very close and accurate proxy for calves that makes sense? 
multiplying this year's wean calf crop percentage by last year's pregnancy rate. And that gives me a pretty good number for calves weaned and cocks post. I want weaning weights and yearling gain. What I oftentimes do, I get those two numbers and add them together. I take Holder, how much, how many pounds did we wean off the ranch? What was our yearling gain on all the yearlings across the whole ranch? And then what was that gain per acre? Calf gain, yearling gain together. What did I do? How many pounds per acre did I gain? And then death loss percentages. You know, death loss, they drop straight to the bottom line. When that critter's gone, it's gone. It'll never, it'll never bring you a paycheck. So I want to be able to manage death losses very carefully. Computers, tablets, smartphones facilitate all of this. You know, data collection, storage, retrieval. When I was a graduate student at the University of Wyoming, 